All right, so uh, I'm going to be starting this again very soon. I'm not exactly sure how, but uh, Nick here has been telling me all the wonders of Zoom. But uh, this is the latest episode of this State Smash podcast. I'm recording it on his computer with his camera for now, um, but it'll be like Skype calls in the future uh, unless I get somebody who wants to do an in-person interview at like Spokane because uh, that's, that's where I fucking live. But... Um, this is the first episode in a really long time, and I'm like, I'm actually gonna make this uh, a podcast podcast uh, that's gonna be available on all platforms, ideally. Um, but when this does become a podcast, I'll let all of you know all of that out of the way. Uh, longtime listeners know that you can find more of this at Jeremiah Talks on YouTube, and you can also find me at Insanity Is Free. But um, this particular episode is going to be the first like in-person interview. We just uh, got done with a recording of Dank Podstash on um, on Facebook Live, and uh, you can find that video and also a recording of it on what YouTube? Yeah, YouTube, uh, and the audio will be up on every podcast player. It's Enemy of the States Dank Podstash. Right. Okay. So subscribe to that. You can already do that. Also, for uh, people who've been here for a while. Uh, you can also get access to uh, the new podcast that I've been doing. Uh, if you're on Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn, not iTunes or Spotify, because iTunes rejected me for one reason or another, and Spotify won't allow copyrighted music. Um, but aside from all of that, uh, we have now the pleasure of talking with the person who I uh, got uh, done talking with just a short bit ago. Uh, his name is uh, Nick Irwin. You can find him on Enemy of the State Stank Podstash. And uh, this is his studio. Uh, as you can see, it's got his uh, banner behind. Uh, well, I mean, it's a studio. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's new. We, like, apparently he set it up yesterday or yeah, last week. Just a little experiment. Um, but it seems to work well enough once we got some of the issues sorted out. Um, but we're recording this on his computer because fuck it, why not? Uh, and ultimately, um, this will end up on my page and also theirs, like maybe a bonus video for whenever they set up their Patreon alternative. They don't really want to go Patreon, but, uh, all of that aside, this isn't about, uh, the technical bullshit. This is about him. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? What brought you to anarchy, um, specifically, and then like secondarily, one thing that makes you truly angry about the state. We'll, we'll give like, you know, five minutes to each. Sure. Um, well, as far as what brought me to anarchy, I've always had a problem uh, with authority, not finding it legitimate in any way in pretty much all the relationships right. in my life. And uh, I was in a punk rock band pretty much right out of high school. And what in, was that? Uh, it's called um, Screaming Dog Army, SDA. And it was in Tucson. And uh, it was kind of during a revival of the Tucson and Phoenix area punk scene. And can people still find that? No, we were not. It was pretty underground. Like we were on one uh, AZ punk compilation and there's one or two videos on YouTube, but nothing too big right. in a couple of zines. But it was more just a, a good experience for me. And that's what brought me around all the anarchy symbols and people with those ideas was the punk music. Right. And uh, I kind of just followed it from there. Um, it's really meeting people in that community, meeting people online, finding books that I could read about it, that kind of stuff that got me into the philosophy and not just fuck authority, smash shit. So, yeah, well, and the fuck authority, smash shit people, a lot of them, uh, have a lot of resentment, but not a lot of direction. Right. And I think that that's a key problem that you isolated when we just talked about shit on, uh, on your show. Uh, so Okay, on that score then, um, talk a little bit about that. What direction do you see um, anarchy taking, and do you see any problem with that direction? Oh, well, I'm. you know, there's so many different factions under the banner of anarchy. I don't know if there's a specific direction that I see it taking. Um, the way that I want things to go is a change in culture, a change in the way all of humanity interacts with each other. Yeah. Uh, for lasting freedom, because I've, I've like we talked about on my show, I have a problem with collapsitarianism, um, with the infighting, with infiltration by different sources. 
and people get so focused on their labels and their tribes and their economic models that they forget to interact positively with each other and people outside and change the way we all work together. Yeah, tribalist clicky. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Um, as far as, I don't even know if I, I see it as a way that anarchy is going, but the world is going, there's going to be chaos. Definitely. No matter no matter which, if it's anarchy, um, statism, the way it's going right now, we're going to go through chaos. Yeah, long-time listeners know that I've been saying things are going to end in rivers of blood and years of darkness for a while. I mean, admittedly, I got the phrase from my life with the Thrill Kill Cult, which is a great band you should check out. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, ultimately, that's the way I see it ending. I mean, you know, raised Christian, similar to what you were. Yeah, yep. Um, and, like, I still see a lot of revelations coming true. You know, either whether people who are religious mean this to happen and they're just trying to get accelerationism to heaven, which is a good way to get to hell if your God is real. Sure. Keep that in mind. But, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, but whether or not that's the case or whether or not it was just an extremely good prediction, right? Um, a lot of this stuff seems to be coming out. A lot of Mark of the Beast with RFID tags, all this, you know, sinister stuff coming out of the surveillance state. So... That, 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 I guess, brings it into a, a, another question. Uh, what aspect of the state makes you angriest? That's It's pretty hard to nail that down to one thing. Then um, don't. You, you can expand as much as you want. Just, just the way that the state hurts people and hurts them in a way and hides it in a way that makes you think that it's for freedom or for good or to help people. Because when you look at it under the surface of what they're doing, you see what they're doing and hurting people and exploiting people. Right. And it's awful. And there's people out there still waving American flags, any country's flag, that are proud of this because they don't look past that surface. Right. So the brainwashing in order to get away with hurting people. Right. To have the approval. That is probably what pisses me off the most. Yeah. And, you, and, you know, to, um, to, to sort of expand on that. Mm hmm you know, most people don't consider the invisible hand of the market, but even fewer people consider the invisible hand of the state. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, like we were talking about on your show, which everybody can check it out, the link will be in the description, but um, ultimately people don't look at the fact that a lot of their actions are directly affiliated with the state's violence. They don't look at the fact that their actions are directly affiliated with the state's uh, pro progress against humanity. Um, and so... Like international shipping, we talked about that. How the like the fact that all this stuff is so easy to access is because of the blood that's been spilled overseas and here at home and the police industrial complex and all that shit. So people don't look at that hidden hand. I'm guessing that's the kind of thing that you're talking about. Yeah, that and and interactions with people specifically about taxation. Um, when I mention stop paying taxes, they say. Well, I'll get arrested. I'll get hurt. And so, well, freedom isn't this cakewalk, you know, and avoiding the state agorism is not necessarily safe, but I believe it's the moral thing to do. And when they come back with, well, taxes pay for good things too, uh, Medicare, you know, saving people's lives, supposedly roads, transport and all that. So well, what about all the people they kill with your tax money? Right. Why not remove your support financially from that? in any way possible yeah well and not just your financial support but the most important currency which is philosophy yes you were talking about being brought up in a christian school um my discussing that and its effect on like your understanding of in indoctrination because a lot of people aren't brought up in christian schools and they don't understand that you see some pretty scary indoctrination in a lot of uh Christian environments that you don't realize are happening at the time, but you can compare them to status methods. Like there was um, a weekend retreat in high school that I had to go to that was looking back based around sleep deprivation and then kind of group feelings when everyone's exhausted through trauma all these bonding. studies. A trauma bonding. Yeah, exactly. Trauma bonding. And you see that in all kinds of different state programs. Yeah, you know, that's part of the reason the military is such a tight-knit unit. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's part of the reason the police are as well. They do hazing. They do all of this horrible shit to you. Yep. And then 
you're still the person along with this great group of people. You haze the next person because that trauma bonding is baked into society. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know. It was it was obviously extremely emotional going through that at the time. But looking back on it, it just made me really angry. And that I suppose that's one of the things, too, that drove me towards individualism, anarchy and freedom and treating people better than that is looking back and realizing that and drawing the connection between that and the state. Yeah, and you know, there there are plenty of actual authentic Christian anarchists, but many of them don't rely very heavily on this sort of oppressive, heavy-handed te uh, technique. Mm -hmm. And most of them, um, most of them have a, a decent chunk of, of people that they associate with who try to keep them on the right path. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the other Christians, they try and work it into their politics. Like I remember my church had this voting guide where they would tell you what to vote for with thumbs up and thumbs down on wow. pieces of paper. Instead of telling you why, instead of telling you, you know, basically vote with your conscience, they would tell you what to vote for and not give you a reason. That's crazy. I've never, never seen that in my experience with that. Wow. Yeah. And, and it, it was, and like assuming voting works, mm -hmm. that's heavy manipulation. Mm -hmm. Assuming it doesn't, that's still manipulation to try and get people invested in the system. And I'm assuming it was similar with this retreat. Want to, want to elaborate on that? Um, you know, I don't remember a whole lot of it. I got just stuff in my past that I don't remember pushed out and whatnot, but, um, I don't know, man. It was just, we went there as a group because there's all different groups of friends from different churches brought to one church for a lock-in two day retreat kind of deal with people guiding classes and things like that, that went from sun up to sundown. So it was, it was a lock-in. That means that it was not even a retreat really, but it was, yeah. a, it was in the same town. It was probably in a gymnasium somewhere. In an actual church. Yeah. Church compound. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it really wasn't even a retreat. It wasn't like one of the ones that I w remember going to where we would do like a camping trip. No, and it was there would... called a retreat. Yeah. Yeah. So, so really it was just an indoctrination Absolutely. Se session. Yep. So, okay. On that note, um, cause I don't want to, I don't want to just get, get on that sort of track and bash Christianity. But what I do want to do is discuss the similarities you see between that sort of trauma bonding and what the state does. Is there, are there any examples that you can think of that, that, that sort of like bridge the gap? Uh, the main things we kind of talked about was just how the military does their training, you know, boot camp and all that stuff. And I've never been through that, so I can't speak, you know, from personal experience. But watching friends that I've had go through that, it's similar. It's right. similar in the hazing and all that. Um, as far as the similarities, well, it's just the structure as well. The, the structure in Christianity with leaders, followers, um, yeah. all that kind of thing. And like you mentioned before, they're legitimate Christian anarchists. But they don't follow necessarily the religious structure, more the, I guess, esoteric teachings of yeah. Christianity. Yeah, so. and, and those Christian anarchists, a lot of them, so, for instance, the Bible says, um, you know, render unto Caesar what is his, but what does Caesar own? Does Not he a own the planet? thing. Right. So that, combined with the fact that, you know, when he said obey the government, he was saying it to a specific church, a lot of Christian anarchists think that the church is heavily manipulated by essentially satanic forces mm -hmm. to try and control uh, the way people think. Now, parallel that to the anarchist movement. We just got done talking about something, and I'll basically let you go off the leash on this. Um, so what do you think of this thing that you just covered in your show? You can elaborate. You can you know, talk as much as you want about people and about the things but um, this is a problem that you saw recently in anarchy. Well, it's a problem that's been around in the outer fringes and hidden. And it's straight up, it's a problem with pedophilia. Mm -hmm. And it's a problem with people with the age of consent discussion that they bring up. Yeah. And the incident that happened was a man who was in the community uh, vocally, but apparently not so about his habits and practices except to a few select people uh, put out a video with his six and eight year old daughters 
talking about their consent and whether they wanted to continue the sexual relationship that they had with him. And the response, I'm definitely proud of the response from the good people in the community because he was instantly, um, almost instantly, the mother of the children was contacted, the uh, grandmother, children were made sure to be safe, and then it was on to finding him and what could be done about it. And he ended up getting snagged by the cops. He was on the run. And um, I believe his name is Yakov Martel, started a fundraiser. He was in contact with uh, the mother. And we hit the $5,000 goal in two or three days, tops, to get the children and the mother specialized therapy. Um, and the problem that uh, David Ballantyne, my co-host on In Me of the States, Dank Podstash, has really been going after is rooting out the pedophiles hiding in the community and their apologists and getting rid of them, compiling names, screenshots, letting them out themselves, honestly, by imposing inflammatory memes, uh, discussions, and people come in and try to defend age of consent in the light that they want to use it for pedophilia. And wham, got them. And we're, like you said, cutting off that dead flesh from the anarchist community because we don't fucking want them. Right. Well, and they don't want you. Yeah. Because that's the, that's, the, that's the important inverse, is that somebody who values one thing more than another doesn't really want the other thing. Mm-hmm. Like, if, the, if, if they can't coexist. It's sort of like, you know, light can't walk with darkness in, in terms of Christianity. Sure. Um, you know, where, where all these so-called Christians are aligning with the state more than they align with Christ or God. Right. Um, this one aligned more with pedophilia than anarchy, and he made his choice. Yeah, and uh, I think that's, and this is just opinion, but where most of the age of consent talks are being brought from is from people who want to violate. Right. So I'm not interested in having that around me. Well, and if it's a mindset, it, like, if it's at all genetic, we need to weed it out. And if it's not, then we need to make a clear statement that this doesn't align with the philosophy. Absolutely. And it 100% doesn't because it's a violation of another being, another body. Yeah. And that's completely against the philosophy of no rulers taken yeah. to its logical conclusion. Yeah, and it, it, like at their most vulnerable plastic Absolutely. stage. Really. Absolutely. So, okay, uh, on that note, um, I'd actually, since we're talking about children, um, it'd be interesting to get to know your particular mindset on uh, parenting itself. Do you ascribe to peaceful parenting? Do you think it's okay to spank? Uh, where, where are your boundaries? I do, you know, I'm not a father. I plan on being a father. My wife and I plan on having children. Um, but yeah, I, I like the idea of peaceful parenting, the philosophy, the stuff I've learned from that. Graham Smith has a lot of great peaceful parenting and yes, unschooling stuff. I've taken a lot from him and his resources. And yeah, I, that's how I'm, and my wife and I are going to raise our children peacefully and um, as sovereign beings themselves. And I don't believe in spanking. And I think it's very simple. I think if there's a lesson to be learned, if the child is too young to understand the lesson, they're not going to understand why they're being hit. Mm -hmm. If they're old enough to understand the lesson, then they're going to learn that violence is the answer. Right. And so that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Well, what what do you think? How would you raise a kid then? What kind of lessons would you teach it and how would you approach? (laughs) That's a tough question. I don't know if anybody ever really knows the answer to that until they get into it. I'm really interested in seeing the interests that my future children want that they discover and growing that. And um, my influence, I would hope, would just be positive guiding and sharing my knowledge that I'm trying to gather now because I wish I would have had that same thing with someone who has the perspective that I have now. Right. So so you're basically... Uh, on a more philosophical bent, and you're going to build your parachute on the way down. Sure. Okay. Yeah, because my like what I like is um, suggestive questioning. I like mm-hmm. leading questions, um, and it's it's a manipulation tactic for sure. But like for instance, there's there's this thing that somebody phrased it to me as: Would you rather have bacon wrapped uh, asparagus or broccoli with cheese? 
And both of those have an element that kids can get behind, very strong sure. contrasting flavors that uh, their undeveloped tongues can get behind, while it still disguises the fact that it has decent nutrients behind it. Um, and, you know, good macros. Either one of those is good macros. Mm -hmm. um, and even though my kid's not going to be a keto kid because that'd be dumb, um, I'm going to try not to have high sugar influence in their primary Absolutely. diet. I know they're going to get candy from other people, but, you know, from me, that's what they should get. Right. Um, so I, I wonder if you see any, like, problems with that particular mentality or if you think that it's, um, like... If you think that it's fine or if you think that it's adopting too much of the status tactic of manipulation and false choices. I don't think so. Not not in not in raising children that way. And it's something as far as getting them to have the food that they need to be healthy. Right. That's totally different from leading them down, I don't know, some heinous philosophical path. Mm -hmm. And I should mention, too, that uh, my wife and I, we want to live as self-sustainably as possible, mm -hmm. uh, employing permaculture on our land, things like that. And uh, one concern that we've had since we want to live out away from cities and children is um, socialization. Right. Just letting them, you know, learn to be around other people. And I think good options are homeschooling groups or maybe even unschooling groups like Graham has uh, worked with in Japan, things like that. And then also technology, I plan on, you have to, there has to be, there has to be a, a way for your children to learn about technology if you want to live out in the sticks. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to interact with the world the way it's going. So. Right. Yeah, he runs the Voluntary Japan uh, yes. thing, right? Yeah. Yep. Well, he and he's a good person, too. Mm -hmm. Very like, good we, person. We, we've had a decent chunk of conversations. Um, I got I to gotta talk to him at some point. Maybe we could talk about peaceful parenting on another weekend uh, i could come out here before i leave again yeah um because i still have plans to move back to socal for those of you who don't know i'm in spokane washington now um but i'm only gonna be here for like in in washington for like a year um all this aside uh so on that score then because manipulation is a tactic the state uses I can also then see that you don't think that it's a problem to do something just because the state does it. So there's a broader ethical concern than a tribalistic attempt at saying that the state is the bar, that as long as you're not the state, you're not doing anything wrong. So on that score, what is your particular approach? I know you like the non-aggression principle. Is there anything you supplement that with? I wouldn't say that I like the non-aggression principle. You don't? No. Okay. Um, I think a lot of it is fine, but I don't align myself with that group of people who says I follow the NAP 100%. Because that's where a lot of the arguments about consent and all that stuff uh, that I see in the ANCAP community quite a bit. And even to ridiculous points, it, it depends on who you apply it to or what you apply it to. I've seen, I think it was, I can't remember his name, Sveslov something threatening Larkin Rose to shoot him if he saw him smack a mosquito because the non-aggression principle applied to all living things. The what? non yeah it, <laughs> it was a weird conversation and I that's something I don't lump myself into. Do you have a do you have a screenshot of that? Or? I can find it. Yeah, I'll send it to you. It's okay. been on a few threads. It's uh That'd be interesting. I'll, I'll put I'll put a little cropped version of it in the thing. And by the way, there's going to be an end segment where David Ballantyne is going to come on and talk about what he would have said. Uh, during the show he had to leave because he has like you know some issue with his kid i, I don't exactly know which, what that is or the missus or something mm -hmm. um but okay so on that note what is your ethical baseline if not the non-aggression principle you know i'm still fleshing that out i believe in voluntary human interactions um i still fleshing out the whole idea of morals and rights subjectively versus objective mm -hmm. um what i I stick to a, pretty much the non-aggression principle. I just don't like to be lumped in to that group. Well, okay, but at the same time, you've got an anarchist flag right behind sure. me. And I'm sure you don't want to be l lumped in with a group that makes fast food workers' jobs harder by bashing in their windows. Sure. So, I mean, to me, I think there's always going to be a negative stigma attached to anyone who's associating themselves with anti-state movements. Right. So, I mean, is it really then the non-aggression principle, or is it more the 
fact that people abuse it to uh, to do things that are negative and shouldn't be associated with it. Yeah, I think it's more people. I don't think the principle is 100% sound. And I guess as a, a better answer to what I ascribe to, it would be the golden rule put as don't do to someone else what you wouldn't want them to do to you. Right. Well, and that's essentially the NAP with an addition. Sure. It's when you start going off of that into a lot of deep tangents right. that aren't necessarily necessary that I, I'm off it. Right. Well, and, and I can see that. I, I try to avoid a lot of the unnecessary dis- uh, discussion as well, especially when people start talking about killing commies as though that's a helpful thing yeah, when no. the primary thrust of libertarianism and anarchy both started out with people that w- would identify with communism in these days. Yep. Um, I mean, de Jacques, for instance, Joseph J- de Jacques um, and the French socialist movement were the first people to call themselves libertarians in a political context. So it's important to not get lost in the weeds. And I can I can appreciate that. Although I do think the non-aggression principle is more of a principle that you can add other principles to. Sure. So I would say that, you know, maybe I, I'm not trying to like grill you here. Yeah, yeah. No I, problem. <laughs> I would say that primarily you do support it, but you wouldn't support it being the only guideline for your personal conduct right nor would you say that it's the only thing that you would support as an as an ethical rule yeah it it's just the way that i've seen so many people interpret it Mm -hmm. and why so many online arguments discussions whatever happen is because people are interpreting it different or applying it to different things right the the be all and end all rather than a useful tool yeah and i just like the idea of being excellent to each other um I, I don't really understand a lot of the the bones that people pick with each other over a lot of bullshit. And we talked about uh, your the term you coined, anarcho-coalitionism. And there's a lot of bullshit to put aside and treat each other with respect with the golden rule, pretty much. Of course, dignity. Because, I don't know, respect is, respect is overused. Dignity, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. But, um, okay, so on that score... Uh, what would you identify most closely with and why in terms of schools of anarchy? I don't know if agorism would be considered a school of anarchy. It is. Samuel Edward Conkin III sure. broke off from Rothbard to create that. I guess I see agorism as more of a tool and can be applied by anyone in any different school of anarchist thought. Right. So I would, I'm would. i an agorist first and foremost. Um, other than that, I don't really have a hyphen. We've, we've talked a lot about hyphenated anarchy on our show and in our posts, and I don't subscribe to any of those. I used to be ANCAP. That's probably where I got my start, and then I just kind of dropped the cap. Well, after your, after your probably somewhat leftist punk days. I didn't really have much uh, left or right political stuff there, just anti-authority. Well, so. right, but a lot of punk scenes... Yeah, they are it, leftist, yeah. And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, either. Sure. Like, a lot of them... Like, that's the thing. Like, I, I woke up this morning listening to Public Enemy, and mm-hmm. I listened to Immortal Technique, and I listened to Rage. Mm-hmm. I don't have any problem with, like, the base ideas of leftist thought. Sure. Um, same way I don't have any problem with the base ideas of some rightist thought. Um, like... And I'm not qualifying it either. Some leftist, some rightist, mm-hmm. but like I, it's it's more of a case by case basis. And and I think that that sounds basically like what you're saying. You're you try to have your primary thrust be agorism because it's useful. Yep. And then like the secondary stuff is all anarchy without hyphens because you try not to pigeonhole yourself into any one thing. Some ANCAP solution, some syndicalist, mutualist, agorist, etc. Well, yeah, that's the thing. People fixate on the different sects and there are good answers and bad answers to a lot of questions in each one right so instead and they just take the whole group then and they go with the bad answers along with the good whereas you could have you you could take everything that makes sense and apply it together right and so on that score um because this is about this podcast is about what people are doing for anarchy um you have a podcast we just got Mm -hmm. done with an episode um have you had anybody, first off, I'm curious, approach you about how your podcast helped them see the light? Um, it's pretty new. Not not specifically, no. Um, that's more in personal conversations, and that's where I really like to do it is interacting with people. I've sent out 
I think three copies of the New Libertarian Manifesto, just to by people, Konkin, yeah, yeah, just to people who have um, messaged me wanting to know more and saying I'm not finding all the answers where I'm at. Uh, what do you recommend? I'm like, and, well, this. and that's like a physical book that you yeah. sent out. Mm-hmm. So you have like a box somewhere. I just buy them when I need to and send uh, them out. Yeah, I would. I, w- I would recommend wholesaling. It's going no, to be cheaper to. for you in the long run. <laughs> well, that's actually a project that David and I are going to be coming up on soon with the podcast. Uh, well, through the Enemy of the State Stank Podstash brand, we'd like to do um, kind of a book donation kind of deal because I know a lot of people are totally fine with going through books, getting rid of them after they've read them. And I think it'd be great if we could buy them at a fraction of the price or even if people want to donate them. Right. And then that way, if anybody wants to read them and hasn't read them, we can ship them out to them. And then maybe if you get on subscribe star, Bitback or whatever these things is, you could like have um, or whatever grammar. Fuck. Um, <laughs> the You could have like a package where they could yeah. get like, you know, certain perks of like certain books and certain information that they could expand their knowledge with. That is part of our plan. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Well, then th- that's a great plan. Uh, OK, then. You say it's new. How many episodes are you on? Uh, we just finished episode 25, and we started out, I believe, bi-weekly, just for a couple of weeks, and then it kind of took off in popularity, and now we're doing weekly. We'll see, because so. my, my weekly hellscape is episode 6. That's new to me. Sure. Like, I think you're I think you're, you're fairly well-established at this point. I, I, I would stop using the new moniker. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it, but... <laughs> well, yeah. Well, time flies. Yeah, absolutely. But... but you know, you don't want to understate your value in the marketplace. You know, like Immortal Technique says, don't be a commodity. Well, I, I want to keep the spotlight off of us. And on the, the ideas. Show, on the ideas and on the people yeah. that come on the show. Because our main, the whole thing that we want to do is create strong voices. And I and wanted to ask you, what are some of the most interesting conversations you've had with people? And was it more the people or the ideas in those cases? Like, you can expand as much as you want. Hmm. That's interesting. Um I have a terrible memory, but some of the one. Well, okay, so we talked with uh, a guy, a good friend named Hody Johns, who was a minarchist the first time he came on the show, and through the show and interactions with people who saw the episode, listened to the episode, and then also his uh, debate on voting with Larkin Rose, Hody decided, well, I guess this is wrong. I'm an anarchist. Uh, even not even deciding that it was wrong, but his views aligned with anarchism more closely than minarchism. Right. And Hody's a master conversationalist. He's wonderful to talk to, very intelligent. And so seeing that transition after being on our show and then bringing him on again as Hody the anarchist was one of the most interesting things that we've done in a two-part kind of deal. See, and, and you were just telling me that you've never had anybody come and tell you that they saw the light. Well, I wouldn't directly take, you know, credit for that well, you, at all. But. Well, yeah, but you were part of the process. Sure, sure. yep. I mean, th- that's the thing. Nobody is ever going to be, like, one person switch. Right. Like, I think I've had one person come up to me and tell me I was the only reason they looked at this at all. Hmm. And they knew me in person. Mm-hmm. So, it's, you know, it's a process. <clears throat> it's not just you. Absolutely. It's Konkin. It's Larkin Rose. It's, you know, David Ballantine. Mm-hmm. Um, all of these people involved in this collaborative project to make minds different than they were when they started. Yeah. So on that score, what's the most psychologically engaged conversation you've had? Like, what what's the conversation you've had that had the most useful tools for changing minds? Uh, it was outside of the show, actually. Um, the most recently, recent one that sticks out in my head um, was a call with my mom and dad and they're in Arizona. I live up here and I can't remember what brought it up, but I was talking about cops and that cops have no obligation to protect us, even ruled on by the Supreme court duly. Now, yeah. no obligation to provide protection. And my dad just wasn't having it. He's like, no, they enforce some laws that protect people, so they're protectors. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, absolutely. Just because it, they happen to fall into that sometimes does not mean that they are protectors. Right. They violate far more often, and there could be protection without them. And it was an hour-long conversation, back and forth, emotions, obviously. And uh, it worked out pretty well, at least to the point where there's a lot, there's a lot more that he was open to then. It was definitely a very uh, heated and engaged conversation. 
Okay. And and that's a good example of like sort of real world anarchy. Mm -hmm. Trying to convince people on, on, on their own grounds, like not on a show or a platform like this. Sure. Where like, you know, we've got a camera between myself and the audience and we've got some distance between you and I right now. Um and not over the like the the, the, the phone with somebody who you've never spoken to sure. before. But like some sort of like real people that you've connected with and uh, and and like engaged well with. Um, let me ask you though, um, which stranger other than Hody was the most receptive in your in your mind's experience? Most receptive. Um, on the show or off the show, or does it matter? Uh, either really. Uh, a coworker of mine named Mac. Um, I just noticed he had some anti-authoritarian kind of leadings and stuff. And I slowly started asking him about why, like, what do you think about cops? Things like that. And, um, I don't know, probably a month or two ago, he's like, you know what? I think you're right. I think I am an anarchist. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I mean, he started listening to the show. I've recommended books for him to read. He started following some pages on social media, learning about stuff. And he's just all in. Very cool. It's a really awesome. Yeah. And, uh, and in terms of the show, uh, which episode do you think is the most useful for somebody like him? Okay, that is something that we're actually going to be working on because we started out um, geared towards or catering to the people already in the movement. And we really wanted to get into deeper ideas instead of the entry to anarchy. Um, and so we don't really have anything that I would recommend other than po probably the episodes with Hody Johns. Uh, either one of those. Check those out because it's minarchist to anarchist there. But we're going to be starting a series, whether it's in regularly scheduled shows or small short videos about what anarchy is for the outsider to get people in. Um, I don't... The reason I thought we should do this is because you, you YouTube it like someone you search on YouTube for what is anarchy. And there's right. not a whole lot of good stuff there for people to look into. I, I like know, bit butter. Okay. I know, uh, Larkin Rose has just started, uh, what, what is anarchy not, or what anarchy isn't a little book that he's putting out, Yeah, which is great. But I want to be someone to be able to search what is anarchy and have a five, 10 minute, super informative video, easily relatable pop up. Right. So we're going to start hopefully a series on on that, and hopefully a lot of people start doing that. Too. Right. Okay. So it, the the Hody Johnson episodes, though, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of ideas did he say he had before and after, and did he give a reason for the transition, or just say that he stopped the others? Well, the main thing was voting that he was clinging to, voting in a governmental sense, um, not thing. like a Twitter poll. Right. Exactly. And he had, he brought up uh, great examples of voting outside of government voting in the past that had worked. And I think that's what brought him to the idea, well, this is outside of government voting. These are people coming together and saying, uh, I can't remember, it's from 1400s. Uh, at some point, it was a group of people who were going to re refuse growing grain for their Lord anymore and being abused. And they got together and said, all right, are we going to do this or not? So it was a vote between the people saying, do we risk everything and you know, throw off our oppression or do we just keep doing it? And the vote was, yes, we're going to throw off the chains of oppression. And I think him seeing that and having that discussion in the debate with Larkin Rose really was like, oh, well, that's a voting that makes sense. Whereas trying to tell somebody you have the authority to do something that I don't have the authority to do. You have the right to do something that I don't have the right to do or be my master, whatever, through voting doesn't make any fucking sense. Right. Okay, so on that score, would you assess then, um, or would you say that more experience is necessary before coming to a conclusion, that voting is the primary thing that you would consider as a way to get to non-anarchists, maybe minarchists and libertarians? Well, li libertarian minarchists, because libertarian is anarchist, but whatever. I think it's a good way. Uh, it gets heated quite a bit. I personally think voting is completely useless. I don't think it's an endorsement of anything. It's all a facade. It's just nothing. It's a waste of time. Um, I think the primary way for talking about getting to minarchists is sticking to principles and following things to their logical conclusion. 
because you get them kind of trapped at a certain point when you're talking about what rights government has or doesn't really have. You mm -hmm. can't give away rights that you don't have. You can't give those to government. And once you get down to that kind of base conversation, they realize that. And it kind of turns, I, what I've found is that their idea of government is more a um, organizational tool. And um, Right. Yeah, and at that point, it doesn't even need to be a government in the sense that we talk about it. Right. Well, and, and of course, govern, government includes like, like uh, governing boards on corporations sure. and businesses and things. And so people try to pull that rhetorical bullshit. So let's say this is a boxing ring. When you've got him in that corner, how do you knock him? There's no coercion necessary to make these things happen that you want to happen. So pull out the coercion. You don't have a state anymore. You have governance, not a government. Well, okay. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> the coercion um, that you discuss, is that coercion um, applied universally or is that coercion in the form of uh, basically fuck around and find out like we were discussing, that coiled snake around the grenade? Because mm -hmm. technically, uh, by the raw definition of coercion, even saying that if you trespass, I will shoot you is coercion. Sure. So do you mean removing coercion or do you mean basically the non-aggression principle that, that, that as soon as people aren't initiating that force, it's suddenly ethically acceptable? And if so, um, how do you convince somebody that initiating force is wrong when they want to do that usually for their own means? Like they're usually the kinds of people who say we ought to have a law sure. or... This is why we need government. Right. So how do you convince them to transition from one mindset to the other? That's usually a lot of long conversations. <laughs> um, as far as why would why should you not initiate force or aggress against somebody? It's, in my mind, basic self-preservation. Because the more that you're out there um, doing that to other people, initiating aggression, the more retaliation is going to come back your way. John Wick. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's it's just basic human survival not to put yourself out there as a target. Mm -hmm. You're putting a target on your back every time you aggress against somebody else, whether by them in retaliation, uh, family, whatever. Or by the people who supported your actions as part of a structure coming after you because you, you left the plantation. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't remember the beginnings of that question. It was a long question, but... Um, well, basically, the, the beginning was defining a separation between coercion and other sorts of force. Right, right. Because coercion is basically don't uh, do this or else, or don't do this or else. And you were right when you said more like the non-aggression principle then. Right. But it's what, what comes up a lot is like, well, that's what we need taxes for. Taxes would be fine if they're voluntary. Mm -hmm. It's like, what ta voluntary taxation is, is not taxation? a thing. taxation? Yeah. It, you, what, you're, you're just trying to cling on to the, the terms and the world that you're comfortable with mm -hmm. and calling it voluntary taxation. Wrapping in a blanket, like like when I'm accepting a PayPal or Venmo donation, which, hey, you can uh, hit me up in the description for that sort of shit. But um, whether it's doing that or something else, I don't need an IRS. I don't need a government goon squad to make sure I can do that. Yep. And so you would say that convincing people isn't really the way um, more like directing them to the information and the knowledge, the factual, concrete um, sort of training that there is another way. Yeah. Because they have to unschool themselves. Absolutely. You can't convince somebody. It's not possible. You can plant the seed, but mm -hmm. people convince themselves. It's sort of like you put the red pill in their hand or you let them take it, but they, they, they have to be the one to consume it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's uh, consent. You know, they consent to wanting to learn. And if they don't want that, then they probably aren't anarchists. Probably not. Probably. Uh, and, so, you know, the, the weird thing is that a lot of minarchists, big L libertarians, won't admit that they're okay with coercion or aggression for certain things. Oh, uh, Austin Peterson. Certain things. I had a conversation with him once, and he, like, Halfway through, said the non-aggression principle is an ANCAP suicide pact. Hmm. 
I, I I'm still debating on whether or not to make a propaganda image of that, but you know, you, you guys can let me know. I have 570 subscribers on YouTube. You guys can duke it out in the comments or whatever. I vote yes. But um, cause the fact that somebody is trying to claim to be the most libertarian, mm -hmm. um, and they still say things like, you know, the non-aggression principle is an end cap suicide pact, even though it basically applies to all schools of anarchy, as long as they're not like red market or sure. stern right anarchy, which I really don't consider anarchy. Um, you know, I mean, th there's like, there's so much play here and people try to have a game about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the chief problems. So on that score, how would you respond to the common libertarian or anarchist trying to weasel their way out of basic libertarian principles in order to be pragmatic or big L? Uh, I respond with memes, <laughs> generally, because I think memes really spike it into people's brains hmm. that it, it, it puts the stupidity front and center. And you can express so much with so little. The the glaring inconsistency in the logic there. Like that sweating guy meme where he's yeah. pressing two buttons or the, um, Oh, I hate these people, but the, <laughs> like the, the pawn shop, like argument thing. Oh the, uh, the West coast choppers or whatever. Orange yeah. County Choppers argument. Well, one of my favorites is one that, uh, my friend Daniel Johnson made. Oh, um, uh, he's good people. Yeah. Daniel's he, great. If, if I recall correctly, he was part of the, the Panda people against the NDAA. Uh, could be. I'm not sure. Um, I just know him from, you know, shit posting and memes. And he's been on the show and a couple group chats. But he did a really good one of the just like little stick people with the LP ball on the on one's head and an or a voluntary voluntarious ball on another. And then uh, the USA ball talking to the LP ball um, and talking about freedom. And pretty much the LP ball trying to worm its way out of the conversation, saying, no, but I'm with this guy with the voluntarist ball. And he's like, I don't fucking know you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Things like that. It's like, if you're not for it, don't claim that you are for it. Right. Well, and it's sort of like the, the dichotomy between the, the Gary Johnson voters and the, uh, the people who wanted a McAfee or a Daryl Perry. Um, where you have a more extreme element that won't make libertarianism look good uh, to, to the statist who wants the aggression, but will provide a clear and distinct choice between statism and voluntarism. Um, and that, that sort of like, the fact that that was presented as an option, would you agree that that proves that the libertarian party isn't a representative of libertarianism since they consistently turned that sort of option down? Yeah, absolutely agree with that. I mean, it was started as a joke, or it was a start as a way to get the the word out there, to get information out there. Mm -hmm. And if it's become about winning and popularity contests and making money, it's not doing its job. Which is why I'm sure you're okay with the James Weeks, like, stripping yeah. on stage and dildos jokes. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Because it's bringing back the original spirit. If they're not okay with those sorts of jokes, then they're not actually libertarians. Well, and the thing is just, it's trolling what it's become now, because it's garbage. Right. And I and this is not trashing the people who have good ideas within it. I want to talk with those people. I want to talk with everybody. It's just like McAfee. I'm sure you wouldn't mind getting I'll talk on with the anybody. Podstash. Hell yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> I'll, I'll well, I'll talk with almost anybody. I don't want to say anybody, but at this point, the stuff that like James Weeks does and whatnot is trolling what has become an establishment. Right. And I don't know if there's any hope to save it to put out information that people are going to be interested in anymore. I think it's the political party system is completely obsolete, obviously, mm -hmm. and trying to be a part of it is stupid. Well, trying to be a part of it just makes us called Republicans on wheat. Sure. Yep, absolutely. I think podcasts, this kind of stuff is just absolutely blowing up right now. It, some podcasts reach more than mainstream media. It's a quick, easy thing that you can pop into with a, you know earbuds while you're doing something. It's the way to get the word out there. Yeah, like the Joe Rogan working. method, where yeah. you break it down to the common person's level by asking enough good questions that they could understand. Keep it, like, away from the esoteric. Yeah, I think that's a good way. And then there's, but there's a place for the esoteric as well, because you got to keep growing in your ideas. Mm -hmm. So 
I think, uh, yeah, getting out there in a relatable way is the way to do it. And I really don't think the party system is the way to do that anymore. People are already disillusioned with the major popular parties. So your 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 takeaway primarily is the best way to convince people um, that anarchy is the solution isn't necessarily to show them anarchist solutions, but to convince them that government isn't one. Yeah, because I don't think you can offer solutions because mm-hmm. it's all hypothetical until the state is gone. You can offer a path, you can offer tools, but I am honest when I talk with people and I say, I don't have all the solutions because it's not here. Right. Or like when people want something short because they're in this hyper-saturated social media culture where mm-hmm. some of it, like, I, I, I say this probably too much. That's a book, not a tweet, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, people want the, the small thing and they want you to condense it all into a nice, neat little package. But like, you know, like like Immortal Technique said, I quote him a lot, but he mm-hmm. says a lot of good shit. You can't, there is no market for, you know, um, uh, like complete, like unfiltered truth in hip hop. Sure. Well, and a lot of times people want you to compact that message so it's easier to pick apart. Because right. they're not actually wanting to learn. They're wanting to destroy it. Right. And it's just not an honest way to go about it. it. You need to have long form conversation. So you start with the meme to maybe needle somebody and then the people who come up to you who are upset about it, mm-hmm. um, you talk to them. Yeah. They're your real audience. And I don't talk to people who are fucking assholes about it either. Uh, I'm totally fine with trolling if all someone wants to do is be a fucking asshole. And, but I'm more tolerant than a lot of people, I guess. I will talk. Uh, through trolling to try to get to a conversation but right um a problem a lot of people have when asking for solutions that anarchy could bring is framing the the ideas that i put forth in the current system and it's obvious that's not going to work in the current system Mm -hmm. because we have the government over us right now doing the things to stop us from interacting voluntarily right sort of like you know when people tell me that they're already completely separate from the system when i just saw them use dollars sure yep like the system has infested everything it's a cancer and we must be expert surgeons Mm -hmm. and that's a lot of learning to become an expert surgeon that's a lot of learning and i don't think you know like a surgeon nobody ever stops learning Mm -hmm. it's called a practice for a reason exactly okay so on all of this score, um, we're about to the to the hour mark. Um, what is a key thing that you want people to, to take away from this discussion? And then what's a key thing you want people to remember about your approach and uh, what you want from your podcast? Because if we could get more people interested who are interested in being guests on that podcast yeah. who could maybe help with your approach... I think that that would be very helpful. So what do you want out of it and how can people help you get that? Well, just the key things in general. And, you know, I'm not good at it all the time. I think kindness is very important. Um, Studying, knowing what you're about, what you're talking about, and not backing down on your principles, holding to your principles. Because a lot of people are willing to sacrifice principles for convenience for safety for a lot of different things and sacrificing that doesn't lead you further in the direction you want to go it holds you back it entirely seeds the ground absolutely loses the fight entirely once you stop making it about proceeding on principle yep once you lose principle for pragmatism absolutely um that's overall the most important as far as the show um i want everybody to have a voice i want because everybody has something to say that's pretty much good most of the time when you get them on there to talk. So even if somebody said that they disagreed with you and wanted to come on and debate, you would accept that? Sure, come on. Um, we're going to be hosting some debates uh, coming up, uh, mutualism and capitalism, with Hody Johns representing mm-hmm. capitalism and Jack Neeson representing mutualism. But, yeah, I mean, I hate the idea of celebritarians. I hate the idea of famous people in the anarchist movement um we want to build strong voices and the only way to build a strong voice another strong voice is to be a strong voice first 
Yeah. Well, sort of like I went over recently the uh, the fact that Rothbard was really selling out hard in his later years, mm -hmm. and he uh, he for instance shilled for George H W Bush because he quote wasn't Clinton among mm -hmm. other reasons, um, and like secondarily. Uh, he, he wanted to unleash cops on, on the bums and vagrant classes, um, and, he, and he wanted a strong right-wing populist thing. And he said it all because he was impatient. Yeah. Um, so on that score um, of being impatient, of sacrificing principle for pragmatism, uh, what would be your best way to talk to a pragmatist uh, and talk them down off this suicide, which is the real, true and cap suicide of um, removing the philosophy from an ultimately philosophical question. Well, if you're impatient, if you're rushing it, it's not going to work. It's, it's like the idea of collapsitarianism. Um, you're cre going to create a power vacuum or you're going to break the tools along the way. You're not going to follow the right steps it's not a short-term thing. It's not a thing we can get to quickly. I don't expect to see it in my lifetime. Um, I think it's a multi-generational multi work that needs to be undertaken. It's the evolution of humanity completely. And it's also the, uh, the de-evolution of the state because yeah. the state has evolved under very favorable conditions and we must make the conditions unfavorable to the state. Absolutely. Give them steely ground instead of this fertile soil. Yep. That's why uh, I love agorism so much. It's just stay out of the state and be the thorn in their side. Be the thorn in their side. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap. Uh, anything you want to plug? Anything at all? Just uh, Enemy of the State's Dank Podstash. Um, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, soon to be Minds and MeWe, and hopefully dropping a website in about a week. Very cool. All right. Well, uh, I think that settles it for Stay Smash Podcast. This has been Jeremiah Harding and Nick Irwin signing out, and also probably Dave, David Ballantyne um, coming in with a message afterward. We'll see about that. It might or might not be included. I'll, uh, I'll let you all know. Cool.